never know what it is to become the perfect version of ourselves. This is Decoding Superhuman with your host, Boomer Anderson. Superhumans, Boomer Anderson here, and welcome back to another episode of the Decoding Superhuman podcast. So on the Decoding Superhuman podcast, I occasionally get really excited, get really bubbly. In fact, I'm always excited about this show. But when somebody brings up the idea of a systems approach or a complex system, I get excited. And that's because we think at Decoding Superhuman that the complex systems approach is the best path to higher performance. One aspect of that complex systems approach that we haven't touched on too much is environment. And environment, like the word terroir that a French sommelier occasionally uses, is everywhere. But today we're going to be talking specifically about your home environment and really how to construct a healthy home. My guest today is the expert behind the experts. He's a guy who I hunted down because he has a vast amount of knowledge when it comes to how to construct a healthy home. He has worked with people like Ryan Sterngle and the Stern Method, as well as a number of others. But Andy Pace is the founder and owner of the Green Design Center in Waukesha, Wisconsin. He launched that company in 1992. Green Design Center is now the premier retailer of green and healthy home building and improvement products. And he has become nationally recognized as an expert on green and healthy building products. This is why I got to know him through the Stern Method. He's authored numerous articles about construction of healthy homes, which have been published in regional and national magazines, such as Environmental Design and Construction, Ecological Home Ideas, and Paint Dealer magazines. He's also been featured in numerous conferences, including the National Healthy Home Conference, the Decorating Contractors Association, Construction Specifications Institute, say that one five times fast, National Hardware Manufacturers Association, and Southern Building Materials Association. His business ventures have been very successful and illustrates his long and strong understanding of the green and healthy products market. And so what did Annie and I get into? Because this one was an episode that was very, very long overdue. But Annie and I talked a lot about the home and really some of the elements of the home that you may not realize are toxic. Let's say you, Mr. Homeowner, just went out and bought a house. What can you expect, even if it's a new home, in terms of toxins? And then we talk about formaldehyde, mold, and why those are two specific toxins that you may want to look out for. We talk about how to test for different toxins in your home, and he introduced me to something new called the prism test, which we get into on the show. We get into air, and air quality is something that I have uh, a tremendous amount of appreciation for. And one of the things that we talk about is which air filter is best. So you're going to want to tune into that. The show notes for this one can be found at decodingsuperhuman.com slash healthy home. And do me a favor, shoot me a message at podcast at decodingsuperhuman.com. Let me know if you like this episode. And I would love to have Andy back on for a round two. Let me know what you think. And enjoy my episode with Mr. Andrew Pace. The sponsor for today's podcast is Neurohacker Collective. The chairman, Jordan Greenhall, has been on the show to talk about one of my favorite topics and episodes to date, sovereignty. And the medical director has also been on the show to talk about unleashing your human potential through epigenetics. That's Dr. Daniel Stickler. But why do I love Neurohacker Collective so much? Well, frankly, it upgrades me on a day-to-day basis. Actually, I take their products five out of seven days of the week. Their original Qualia stack is something that I absolutely and still thoroughly enjoy. It's packed with over 40 premium brain nutrients to immediately enhance your focus, energy, mood, creativity, and all while supporting your health. Their new flagship nootropic, Qualia Mind, is a premium nootropic supplement that helps support mental performance and brain health. And frankly, with both products, I do not get the crashes that I commonly get with nootropics and other supplements. So I want you to go over to their website and check it out when you have a chance. It's neurohacker.com. And if you subscribe, you get 15% off by using the code BOOMER. If you want to just do a one-time purchase, you get 10% off, again, using that code BOOMER. And while you're there, pick up their free foundational guide to neurohacking. It's definitely worth checking out. But please, enjoy the show. (music) 
Andy, welcome to the show. Good morning, Boomer. Great to be with you today. Uh, this is an incredible conversation on such an important topic that needed to happen for a very long time. So I'm glad we were able to connect. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I love talking with other people who are in both in our industry and ancillary to the industry because I believe that it all crosses over in one way or another. So today we're going to be talking about lovely toxic homes and toxic environments that we potentially live in. Now, for a lot of people listening out there, this may be the first time they've thought of their home as toxic. Maybe they just bought their Toll Brothers, you know, XYZ kit home, and they think that everything's all right. Do you mind just kind of walking through some of the common toxins that may be in the house and why these may be an issue? Well, let me start with this. The average home that's built today has anywhere between 8,000 and 15,000 different chemicals in it, just from the building process. Now, these, these are estimates that have been formed by uh, experts throughout the last 25, 30 years. It's hard to exactly pinpoint all of them because of the fact that once chemicals start to off-gas from a surface, they can actually react with other chemicals to create new chemical compounds. So in the average home that we walk into, brand new home, there are the odiferous chemicals, the things that everybody smells. Formaldehyde is, is key. Uh, and I will say this actually throughout the entire uh, interview today formaldehyde is really the key that we look for, that we look to try to eliminate because it also brings with it a whole host of other chemicals that are uh, either petrochemically related or of the same molecular size and weight. And we know that if formaldehyde's coming off the surface, so will all these other chemicals. Uh, but when you walk into this new home, the areas that you can see and touch, these items are what affect most people, whether they even know it or not. And I'm not even talking about people who are chemically sensitive. I'm talking about the average homeowner. So your flooring materials, wall finishes, cabinetry, and furnishings and finishes. So furnishings and finishes would be your furniture, your window treatments, other fabrics, uh, artwork, and so forth. So really in that order of offense in the home, flooring materials, wall treatments, cabinetry, furnishing and finishes. Wow. Okay, so basically our homes are toxic. It sounds like they're pretty toxic, right? Yeah, it, you know, whether they are toxic, it has to do with, and really it doesn't have to do with quality, I'll be honest with you. Uh, you could build the highest quality home from a durability uh, and aesthetic direction, but it still can be toxic. On the flip side, you can build a very inexpensive home cutting corners wherever you had to in order to make the home affordable, but you can do it in a healthy way. And I, I can make that home healthier. I, you know, it just, it really doesn't matter. Uh, it comes down to choosing the right materials. Before we go on to my next question, I'm just curious, why is flooring so important? Is it specifically carpet or is it all flooring in general? Flooring is important because obviously if you have a 3,000 square foot home, you've got 3,000 square feet of offending material. And so that's why, again, flooring and walls, the two biggest surfaces in your home are the, are the uh, biggest potential for chemical release. Uh, flooring is extra uh, dangerous because it's a thicker amount of material. Let's take in, for instance, carpeting. If um, you've listened to any of my podcasts, you'll hear this continuous cry to get rid of all carpet in your home unless you know where to get completely synthetic chemical-free carpet. I have tested carpeting that's as old as 30 years old in somebody's home that's still off-gassing formaldehyde at toxic levels. And I, it, this is a... Um, this is a huge problem in our industry, and I'm sure we'll get into it a little bit, but it has a lot to do with the fact that we get lulled into this sense of security when we see all the green labels and, you know, somebody puts a leaf on a package and, and the average consumer believes that it means that it's healthy and it's not. I want to table that just for one second because there are so many different ways we can take this conversation from here. But on these toxins that you mentioned before, 
isn't necessary that we deal with them. Uh, and I guess said another way, what happens if I wait and don't deal with these toxins? What happens to me as the individual? Are there certain symptoms or expressions that may lead me to needing to take action? Or do I, should I just take action proactively? Well, Boomer, that's a great question. And the reason why it's such a great question is because it really talks about the average consumer who believes that if they don't recognize it, if they don't sense it, uh, if they can say, I've never had a problem before, why is it really bothering me? And this is really what the majority of uh, homeowners will think. You know, if, it, if they walk into a home and coincidentally they get a headache, they don't normally correlate the fact that it might be a chemical reaction. It might be the fact that there's mold spores in the air. So most people do not want to believe that what is around them could be affecting their health. So if you don't take action on this, will th does that mean that you are going to become, you're going to get sick, are you going to uh, get cancer, are you going to uh, have huge health issues down the road? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, and and I, I, I answer it that way because the chemical sensitivity and the reaction of chemicals that are in the body are different from person to person. And the way you react to a, a certain chemical will not be the way that I do. And this is why it's so difficult to point the finger at specific issues. If everybody got sick because of, let's say, peanut allergies, if everybody in the world had a peanut allergy, I think we'd all understand maybe we should get rid of peanuts. But because chemicals are different, because the way I react to formaldehyde or to an isocyanate in a, in a, a two-part urethane is, the way, is different from you, you're going to say, I don't believe you. I've never had a problem. And this is really where the bulk of the industry is, this is their sticking point. Mm -hmm. I've got you know, painting contractors, builders, architects who will say, there's not a problem. Listen, I've been in this industry for 30 years. I have never had a reaction. And therefore, nobody can have a reaction. Mm -hmm. And so it's a really difficult uh, situation to be in. So do you need to go back to your question? Do you need to take action on these toxins? You really should. And if it's not for, for your sake, it's for the sake of your family. It's yeah. for the sake of the next generation, because a lot of these toxins will build up in the body and also start to affect how we pass that along to the next generation. Absolutely. Well said. And I think, you know, I don't like everything that Dave Asprey does, but he did do a great documentary on mold that kind of highlights some of the things that could happen if you don't address them. But I, you mentioned two toxins there specifically, uh, formaldehyde and, and mold. Do you mind going through just sort of what, and maybe we'll start with formaldehyde, uh, so formaldehyde, I think of it as embalming fluid, right? And I, I also question why it's involved in anything else. But what specifically can happen and why, I know you've emphasized it a couple times already, why is that so significant to just get rid of? Boy, it's significant to get rid of because it is in so many things that we come in contact with on a daily basis. And because of that, it's starting to affect uh, our DNA. As you said, uh, formalin, what's used to preserve both uh, for uh, embalming fluid, but also for, think of it in high school, when you were dissecting something for high school science class, uh, that was always kept in, in that uh, liquid formalin solution. And we recognize that smell, that sweet smell. Well, form formaldehyde is actually found in many formats throughout the entire building industry plywood is glued together using urea formaldehyde. Carpeting uses formaldehyde in the dyeing process. Um, formaldehyde is found in, in paints and coatings, not as an ingredient. And this is where it really becomes difficult to, to assess. Formaldehyde can be created after the fact, and here's why. In a gallon of paint, you can actually add in several different chemicals that do different things, whether it's for flowing agent to keep it from freezing, to give it better curing times. In a liquid state, you cannot detect formaldehyde. 
But when you put the paint on the wall and it starts to cure, it actually chemically reacts and creates formaldehyde to assist in resisting mold. So that's what's called an antifungal. And because of that, manufacturers are completely allowed to say, we do not use formaldehyde in our paint because we don't. They use what are called formaldehyde donors or formaldehyde precursors. And these are those chemicals that create after the fact, after you put it on the wall and it starts to cure, creates formaldehyde. And formaldehyde is a key trigger for people with allergies, asthma, and chemical sensitivities. And I really will stress asthma. Asthma rates throughout the world are skyrocketing for, for a variety of reasons, whether it's uh, food related uh, or what's being passed down uh, from past generations. But it's also because of things like formaldehyde. Formaldehyde does not cause uh, asthma. Formaldehyde is, though, a key trigger for an asthmatic reaction. And because it's so ubiquitous, it, we are just constantly bombarded. The clothes we wear contain formaldehyde in the flame retardants. Just about any building product you can imagine has the potential to, to uh, contain formaldehyde. And we know how dangerous the chemical is. It is a classified carcinogen, so it is a cancer-causing agent. But because it's so ubiquitous, and every manufacturer seems to use it in one form or another, the building industry will never let it go. This is crazy. Aside from, it's a known carcinogen. It can cause asthma. Well, it can trigger asthma attack. Yep. What other kind of, for lack of a better word, symptoms do you see with people with formaldehyde sensitivity? So the best example I can give you for this is if you or somebody you know moves into a brand new house, really assess how they are after a period of a day, a week, a month. Just about every situation that I can remember where family and friends have moved into a new home, uh, and this is prior to changing their ways, but just about any situation I can remember, when, when the family moves into a new home, everybody in the family seems to get a cold. You know, everybody gets this general malaise, these flu-like symptoms, headache, stomach ache, dizziness, body pains, runny nose, uh, all of these flu-like symptoms. Generally, it's because of, it's not because of the fact that the family's worn down from the move and somebody in the family has got, got a cold and they pass it along to everybody else. And it's usually because of being bombarded with these chemicals when they, when they moved into the new home. But most people don't associate that. They look at it as all the other possibilities that it could be instead of actually looking at the, the real problem, which is we just moved into this toxic box. There is, there's not enough fresh air. There's not enough uh, purified air. And we have no choice now. We have to breathe this in 24-7. All right. We're going to come back to air in a second. But the other toxin that you mentioned specifically was mold. And... You know, I'm, I was one of those kids who got pricked and went and had allergy shots when I was younger. And one of the allergies that I do have is mold. And it's a very prevalent issue with many of our listeners, frankly. How do you identify that issue? I, I guess maybe starting from the top, what are some of the symptoms of mold sensitivity or having mold in your house? And then how do you actually get rid of it? A lot of the sensitivities or a lot of the symptoms are very similar to formaldehyde. Honestly, mm -hmm. the two are very close in how they uh, interact in the body. Mold, as it's blooming, uh, actually creates a toxin, uh, which is classified as a VOC, a volatile organic compound. And this is something you'll read and you'll hear about the need to reduce or eliminate VOCs in the home. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk about that in a second, because this is a really, I mean, that's a really important uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. But the, the VOCs that a mold creates is somewhat similar to a VOC that a, a chemical can create. Mm -hmm. And so uh, how do you assess it? Honestly, uh, the, the biggest thing to look for is humidity levels in the home. If humidity is 50% is or above, it, it now is conducive for mold growth. Uh, mold uh, needs humidity or, or moisture. Uh, it needs a uh, generally a, a dark, warm space, mm -hmm. uh, and it needs a food source. And the way we construct our homes, unfortunately, leaves a lot of food sources for mold. 
And this would be things like paper on drywall, uh, the drywall mud itself, the paint itself. These can all be food sources for mold. So if mold becomes, uh, it starts to grow, it starts to proliferate, it'll start to feed off of these materials that we use to build our home. Mm -hmm. Now, this, this is what makes it really difficult in, you know, in new home construction. Generally speaking, if you're going to have a mold problem in a new home or a large remodeling project, it's going to happen within the first year or two of the home being built. Uh, the reason for this is that moisture that's in the air from the construction process, and the average home has between 300 and 500 gallons of moisture in the air just from all of the processes involved of building. And all that moisture has to go somewhere. So eventually it goes into the walls, the exterior walls, and it gets stuck in there. Just due to the construction methods that we use, moisture gets stuck into those walls. And if the wood that's used, whether for lumber, for the sheathing, if any of that material has any mold spores on it, whether you see them or not, uh, as the home is being built, this moisture now that's locked into the wall combines with the mold spores and now we've got a food source and the fact that there's wood everywhere and it creates a toxic mold situation or a potential toxic mold situation. Mm -hmm. And, and so uh, the idea is to uh, eliminate as much of the moisture, uh, eliminate the food sources and make sure you have really good purification inside of the home. And there's many ways to do that, of course, but this is why mold can be a, a, a huge issue in the home. The other issue is the way we operate our houses not cleaning properly, not having good enough airflow, air movement throughout the house. You know, every time you take a shower, all that steam from the shower carries with it soap scum and dead skin cells. And when it uh, goes throughout the bathroom, it sticks to the walls. Then the walls dry. All that material is still left on the surface. And this now becomes, it's, it's like, you know, really good food for mold. And we got to make sure that we run the bathroom fan during a shower 15 to 20 minutes afterwards to get rid of that moisture as fast as possible so it doesn't have time to stick that, that stuff against the walls and doesn't have time to uh, soak uh, through the paint into the drywall and cause uh, a huge mold problem in the future. And people that are sensitive to this, it feels a lot like I've experienced extreme brain fog with it. I know Dave Asprey made the movie in terms of doing it, but or in terms of what happened to him was extreme brain fog as well. Now, when we look at, you mentioned purification. And when I think of purification in the home, uh, specifically when it comes to VOCs and a few other things, I look at air and air quality. A lot of people are thinking like, hey, I'm breathing. Things are okay. I don't feel anything. Do you mind just talking us through what actually is going on there? The homes that are built today, uh, actually starting back in the, in the um, late 80s, early 90s, homes started to be built tighter. Actually, this happened started back in the 70s, but really the, 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 um, the latest iteration of green energy efficient building really started in earnest in the, in the early 90s. And homes were, were being built really tight to be very air, uh, energy efficient. The downside to building a home really tight is there's not enough natural air movement through the walls, through the, the cracks around windows and doors because contractors got really good at sealing up all those gaps and using high performance materials that don't breathe the same. And now we're stuck with uh, people living in these toxic boxes and they might get one, maybe two complete air exchanges per day throughout the house. To have really good indoor air quality, I mean, you need um, two to three air exchanges per hour wow. throughout the house. And so I think it's just due to the fact that the industry and consumers demanded energy efficiency. Um, the unintended consequence of building really tight is we started to build really toxic. Mm -hmm. And now throughout the country, there are uh, a number of not only builders, but municipalities that are uh, requiring the use of what's called an air exchange system, which allows fresh air to come in whenever the, the heat or the air conditioning is on. And this has improved things tremendously. But what it still doesn't do is it doesn't purify the air. And imagine having this home, and right now, in the building industry, there's about 88 
or 89,000 different chemicals that are used in total for all the products that we use in our homes. It's a lot. It's a lot. And a lot of them off gas. And a lot of these chemicals will off gas for the lifespan of the item. Do you mind just real quick on off gassing? That's, do you mind just explaining that for people who may not have heard it before? Sure. Off gassing is the release of unreacted chemical monomers from a cured surface. Mm -hmm. So I'll relate it to paint. You put a coat of paint on the wall, the average water-based paint takes about two weeks to reach a full cure. That means after two weeks, all of the, the water and solvent in the paint has flashed off and, and the surface that's, that's left, that film, is, is fully cured. There's no more moisture or solvent coming off of that surface. It'll never get any harder. After that two-week mark, though, the average water-based paint, even the average zero VOC water-based paint, will now start to off-gas for up to two and a half to four and a half years. Off-gassing would be all of these chemical monomers that never will become part of the film kind of poke out of the surface like dust particles. The average person doesn't sense them, doesn't smell them. However, if you do have a compromised immune system, system yeah. if you are somebody with asthma or have a, a chemical sensitivity, this can be a trigger. Now combine that with all of the other products that you just put into your home, flooring, cabinetry, insulation, caulking materials, all of that combined creates what we call this chemical soup in the house. This is why we really are trying to recommend materials that don't off-gas or we have solutions to seal up the off-gassing from various surfaces in the home. Coming back to air, because all of this stuff gets off-gassed into the air. We're breathing it in every day. People may just not actually know what is possible in their lives because they've been beaten down by this air. How do we get rid of that stuff? And specifically, I'm looking to talk about filters here. Like, are there, can you filter out all of it? Or is it, or are there going to be particles remaining? You can filter out a lot of it. I won't mm -hmm. say all of it. It really takes a whole, what I call a systems approach. Uh, go for it. Love systems here. So think of the fact that it, it, let, let's just imagine we're going to build this new home and we say, you know, the best way to have this home be completely healthy is we're going to install a state of the art uh, heating, ventilating, air conditioning system. This is going to be the highest quality, best filtration system money can buy. I guarantee that somebody with a compromised immune system can still walk into that house and have effects immediately. Well, the same thing is, is true if you say, we're going to build a home with the least toxic building materials we can find, but then we don't address the, the actual air purification. And so you can't just rely on one particular issue and fix that one issue and hope that it's a healthy home. You got you to gotta look at this as a whole system. The use of non-toxic or the least toxic materials available the reduction of moisture during the construction process, whether it's you know allowing ample time for things to dry out before covering them up or using industrial dehumidification, industrial air purification while you're constructing, the installation of good quality windows, you know, bringing natural light into a space is essential for life. The, the feeling of bringing the outdoors in all essential to life, uh, and the the installation of a good quality purification system. The, all these all have to be done together. Mm -hmm. And if you miss one of the areas, unfortunately, you're gonna you're gonna miss the mark a little bit. So if I'm in a city right now and listening to this, saying I'm on a high rise condo in Singapore, for instance, you're kind of SOL, right? It, it's it, I mean, in some ways, you get you open up your balcony door and maybe you get some sunlight and some arguably fresh air in quotes. But other than that, you know, condo life can be pretty hard for this kind of systems approach. What, what can you do? You do the best you can. Honestly, yeah. I'm speaking in, in absolutes here. Mm -hmm. Perfection. If yeah. I had my way, this is the way we would do it. Mm -hmm. But then reality sets in. And you say, well, I live in an apartment. I live in a condo. I'm in the city. 
Um, you know, what can I do? You do the best you can with what you have. And mm -hmm. so bringing in an air purification system, that's a portable unit. And obviously you can't install something to the HVAC system if you don't really own that HVA system. So you have to bring in a portable. You have to supplement with other things, uh, meaning bring a lot of plants in the house, natural plant life to help purify the air. And again, give you that feeling of being in the outdoors. Uh, you've got to find ways to ground yourself. You've got to find ways to purify yourself. And it's not going to be in your home per se, because, you know, there's things that you really can't do. However, you make the best with what you have. And we've worked with clients all over the world in these various situations. And depending on how they're allowed to uh, make changes, uh, you know, what, what they're allowed to do, uh, we usually can't help them choose materials to at least make the space as healthy as possible. Can we talk about air filters for a second? Because if you go on Amazon and type in, uh, let's take, for example, HEPA air filters, you get probably a thousand different options. Anything ranging from like a $10 option to a several hundred or a thousand dollar option. How should we evaluate air filters and is there a specific one that you recommend to people? Well, that, that is a tough question because of the fact that there are, there are so many out there and they all seem to have their specialty. You know, it, the, the list of, of manufacturers that are out there, I can't really say that of the brands that we all know, whether it's IQ Air or, or Austin or Air Doctor, um, they all have their, their pros. It's, it really comes down to availability, uh, what specifically you are trying to target in your air. Uh, some are better for chemical reduction. Some are better for allergen reduction, whether it's uh, pollen or, or ragweed or dust or mold. Some are good for larger areas. Uh, mm -hmm. And there are others like Molecule, for instance, it's really good for one room. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of the best purifiers for one room. Austin is good for larger spaces, especially if you're trying to reduce chemical uh, off-gassing because it has a, a really high amount of carbon in the fiber. But I really can't say anything really negative about the brands that are out there because they all have their positives, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I just think that, you know, you have to find a retailer that you trust and ask the right questions to make sure for your space and what you are trying to contain or get rid of that this is the right choice for you. Don't just buy a brand because it's a brand that somebody is recommending. Buy a, a specific model because that's the model that will work for your situation. This is, this is very helpful. I guess when we look at some of the ways people advertise air filters, there are words thrown out like ionization, ozone, how do you feel, if you don't mind just commenting on like ozone, is it needed? Is there a yes or no? I don't know if there is. Ions, should you be pressing the button to ionize the air all the time, etc.? Well, I think a lot of these um, descriptions are sort of getting garbled up together with the manufacturers <laughs> because they, they really don't want you to know exactly what the technology is. Exactly. And they, they want that competitive edge over the others that are out there. But here, there are, in my opinion, there are, there are three main filtration methods, okay? The first one is, is HEPA. Uh, HEPA filtration uh, is essentially a, a filtration media that will collect particles down to a very, very, very small size. You know, it's 0 0.03 microns or something like this. It's a just tiny, tiny size. Most chemicals, though, are actually smaller than that. So HEPA filtration won't work for chemicals. So the second type of filtration would be carbon filtration. Carbon filtration will absorb chemicals, gases, formaldehyde, VOCs, and it absorbs those things out of the air as the air gets pushed through it. It's not going to collect the dust the same. It's not going to collect pollen and ragweed, but it's going to collect the chemicals. And then the third step is some type of a UV filtration or UV purification. Ultraviolet light is nature's purifier. Mm -hmm. And we know that 
you can put um, you know freshly washed sheets outside and you hang them on the on the the, the, the dry line and the sun not only dries the sheets but it gives the sheets this 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 pure smell mm-hmm. it's actually the smell of ozone uh, ozone is a natural uh, occurrence in our in our atmosphere and manufacturers have created ways to artificially create ozone through a machine it, it essentially you uh, take regular air oxygen gets pushed through the machine and a um, electrical current zaps that air and turns oxygen into O3, which is just oxygen with an extra molecule. And ozone is incredibly effective in purifying air. Ozone can attach itself to any chemical in the air and basically break it apart into uh, hydrogen, nitrogen, and actually purify that space. Mm-hmm. The downside is, though, we know that high levels of ozone can be very, very detrimental, not only to everybody, but specifically to people with allergies and asthma. This mm-hmm. is why there are what are called ozone action days throughout the years, where where there, the um, smog is so high in some cities that the EPA says it's an ozone action day, there's too much ozone uh, in the air, therefore stay inside you know, don't go outside and, and, you know, do a lot of activity and so forth. Um, and that's because nature naturally is creating ozone to take care of the pollutants in the air. And so this actually brings me to the whole VOC discussion. The reason why VOCs or volatile organic compounds are even regulated in this country is because of the fact that VOCs can come off of a product rise into the atmosphere and actually create low-level smog, forcing nature to create ozone to take care of it. So let's get back then. I, I, I don't want to go too far into the VOC thing, but I mean, yeah. I had to use that example to tell the story. Oh, that's great. Uh, but an air purification system you use in your home that creates small levels of ozone, in my opinion, is actually really effective. I know I will have um, a minority viewpoint on this because there are way too many examples of manufacturers that made ozonators for homes that were dangerous because they didn't know how to regulate the amount that it created. That was the genesis of my question because there, it, you, when you start Googling ozone, uh, you, you get a lot of what you just said, people with bad experiences. Exactly. And, pe- and manufacturers who are multi-level marketing companies that um, allowed people who had absolutely zero experience and no knowledge of, of uh, chemistry uh, or science selling a very dangerous machine because they said it purifies the air if you just turn this knob. Well, it does, but then it continues to do damage. And so you've got, again, buying from a reputable company, somebody who knows what they're talking about, small levels of ozone, very small levels. And the, the rule of thumb there is if you can smell it, it's up too high. But mm-hmm. there, you know, there are devices you can use to measure the amounts in the air. But small amounts are really good for maintaining pure air in a home or in an office space. The, the other thing you mentioned, um, ionization. What, what ionization does is it, it doesn't require air to come through a purifying box. It actually pushes out ions into the air, Mm -hmm. Uh, generally speaking, negative ions. These negative ions will travel through doorways, through walls, um, all over the the, the space. And what it does is it, it charges dust particles in the air to the point where they suck together and they all start sucking together in the air and they fall down to the ground. Therefore you can vacuum them up. So the, the, um, the idea there is you know, if you're using an ionizer, you are probably going to be vacuuming more than you ever have, at least for the first couple of months. (laughs) (laughs) But after that point, it's going to be a cleaner space. Here's the downside, though. A lot of those ionizers also make trace amounts of ozone because of the the, uh, electrical process, and there's no way to um, completely uh, control that. And therefore, you've got to be careful which manufacturers or which products you buy. Uh, this is amazing. All right. So if you're 
going to, if you want to start tackling this process today, what are some of the tests that you should be running? What, what are the tests that you recommend that everybody run on their home, if any? It, it really comes down to necessity. Um, obviously, pay attention to your own person. Pay attention to how do you feel when you're not in the home? Mm -hmm. You know, do you feel differently at work than you do at your house? If you feel better at work, it's not just because you have an awesome job. You know, it's probably because the space you're in is less toxic to you. If you feel better on vacation, it's not just because you're on vacation, right? It's because the space you're in is different. If you can recognize every time you go home or on the weekends, you just start to feel this general sense of malaise. Obviously, if you have more specific acute symptoms, different story. But I'm talking about the average person who doesn't really know if there's a problem in the house. If you start to recognize that your space may be toxic to you, one of the first things you can do is check the things that don't really require testing. You know, go to the hardware store and buy a $15 hydrometer to uh, make sure that the uh, humidity in your air doesn't rise above that 50% mark. If it does, well, that could then be sort of a point, you know, a pointer that you might actually have a mold problem in your house. Obviously, visual inspections will be required. But then look, if, if, if these symptoms seem to get a little worse, we work with a, a company that um, it's called a prism air test, where it's a, you know, a couple hundred bucks, and they send you a, uh, a test kit in the mail that you can set up, uh, put these collection tubes in, turn it on for 20 minutes, put the tubes back in the box, send it back to the, the lab, and in a few days, you'll have a report of all of the uh, chemicals, VOCs, mold in, in the space. That's incredible. That's a new one for me. That to me, and, I, and I'll, I'll send you a link for that because that to me is remarkable. The information we get from that test uh, is so eye-opening. And we can then look at that, those results and, and say, well, we know based upon what we see, most of the problem is occurring probably because of cabinetry or because of your carpeting. Uh, yeah. Obviously, if, if we see some results that require digging deeper, then that's what we do. We have to dig deeper. That's great. I, I love this. And I'm the prism air test. I, I want to check that one out myself. So you've already gone into the systems approach to building the ideal home. I guess, let me take the 180 side of that question. There's a lot of advice given out there about constructing a healthy home, all these devices that we need. You mentioned already green label stuff. And so I want to get into that. But what is some of the advice you hear that really kind of grinds your gears, so to speak, and really just makes you cringe? Or, you know, devices that people are using that you think are unnecessary? I love this question. And I'll preface that by saying I've made a career out of uh, finding problems, you know, breaking things apart and finding the problem with it. And so for many years, I was um, involved in an organization called the United States Green Building Council. They're the ones who created the LEED program, mm -hmm. uh, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. People just assume that if a home or a building is built utilizing the LEED program, that it's a healthy space. And that's what really grinds me the most is that people assume that if something is built green, that means it's healthy. And that's completely false. There are literally 27 reasons why a, a building or a material or a system can be called green. One of those would be human health, but the rest of it could be recycled content, energy efficiency, um, locally made, organically sourced, and so on and so forth. So uh, the idea of utilizing a moniker like a, a, a building system rating uh, or a saying something is green and then assuming that means it's healthy is not only um, inaccurate, but it's highly dangerous. So that's probably the biggest problem I have right now. Just to add to that, I think the same could be true for like food labeling, right? You go and buy gluten-free foods or gluten-free labeled foods and you come to find that it has 25 grams of sugar in it just to make it taste like something. And that's, that's no good for anybody, but this is, it's incredible to see how 
much this exists across the spectrum of things we involve ourselves with every day? Well, it's human nature to um, want to believe we're doing the right thing. And, but it's also human nature to not look at things deeper than the very surface because, you know, we all have this, I shouldn't say we all, many of us have this, what you don't know can't hurt you mentality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as you say, with um, gluten free, I mean, back in the 80s, it was fat free, you know, yeah. everything started coming out being fat free, but just loaded with sugar and other things that were even more dangerous. In the building industry, everything today is labeled as being green or eco friendly in some way or another. But 99.9% .9 of those materials aren't actually healthy for humans. They are green because they are energy efficient or they meet some global environmental standard for whether it's groundwater issues, recycled content, even all the way to you know, manufacturers who use natural light in their warehouses and their factories. They actually are allowed to call their products green because they use natural light in their factories. But it doesn't actually make the product any healthier. Wow. This is an incredible conversation. I, I could go on for days. I, I think it's now time just to, to transition into a few rapid fire questions because this is so much knowledge for people to absorb that perhaps we need to even do a round two. Do you mind if I, I go into those final four rapid fire questions? Sure, fire away. Okay, so what is one area that you think people should pay more attention to when they're looking to either improve their health or performance? And you may be biased on this one. Well, I, I'll, I'll give you my, um, I honestly think blanket statement, uh, one way to improve performance is to um, pay attention to the details. I think that today our society has a, a problem with skimming and mm -hmm. skimming everything. Um, people go on and, and do a Google search and they think they're doing research and all they're doing is looking at headlines, they're looking at bold lines, they're looking for those eco symbols on things. You need to get to the details of everything in order to improve the performance because otherwise you're actually going in the wrong direction. Well said. What's your top trick for enhancing your focus? Hmm. Besides coffee. Um, coffee could be one. It's very popular. <laughs> it's the world's original nootropic, right? <laughs> there we go. Um, no, I actually think grounding yourself on a daily basis uh, improves my focus. How, how do you do that? I literally take my shoes off and go walk in the grass. 20 minutes a day, usually during lunch. In wintertime, it's a little more difficult because I'm up here in Wisconsin and you know, it's 50 below zero at some times. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But I find ways, I find ways to uh, supplement that through um, the use of um, uh, different um, uh, media. But um, I do that. I, I, life gets stressful and mm -hmm. all of us have different uh, ways to deal with that stress. But what always works is walking in the dirt, walking in the grass, literally grounding yourself to the earth that improves my focus better than if you know, I know people who take power naps um, and, and it works for them. But for me, grounding myself and I am just laser beam. What book has significantly impacted your life and how you show up to perform in it? Mm, wow. Um, I'll be honest. I'm not a huge reader. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason is that I'm, I'm constantly reading um, technical manuals. I'm one of these guys that I can read uh, a technical manual, you know, stereo instructions to me are like a novel. I love it. <laughs> I, I, I hesitate to ask your favorite gadget then. Oh boy. Um, you know, probably all my podcasting equipment right now is my favorite gadget. Mm -hmm. But I, I read a book a couple of years ago called Everybody Matters. Uh, it's by Bob Chapman. Bob is a CEO of a, of a large company called Barry Weimuller. And he wrote this book because of the need to treat all of your employees and everybody who you associate with as family. And, you know, I come from a family business. Um, I, our business started back in the 30s. And I, I spun off this part of the business back in, in 1992. But, you know, when, when you're an entrepreneur, you have this feeling that 
you're the only person that can do it and no one else can do it better than you can. It's that entrepreneurial myth that you hear about. It's true. Uh, uh, it's, I believed at some point that, um, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna do it myself because nobody else can do it the way I want it being done. And so I read this book, I, I met Bob a couple years ago and completely changed the way I look at things because I do come from a family business. Why don't I treat everybody I deal with as if they're part of that family business or part of the family? And it, it makes a huge difference. And so for somebody who doesn't read a lot besides the technical stuff, I, I really enjoyed that book. You're the second person that's mentioned uh, treating, whether it be coworkers, uh, I guess you can call it just people that are you're affiliated with on a day to day basis as family. So that's pretty. It's pretty interesting. Last question: Where can people find out more about you? Well, I think, you know, I'll, I'll refer you to a website. I have two web websites: thegreendesigncenter.com and degreeofgreen.com. Both of those are involved in either selling materials or selling advice or giving free advice. Uh, but I started podcasting a year ago, and my, my podcast is called Non-Toxic Environments. That, to me, has been – and to me, I don't care if, if, if three people in the world listen to it, I'm happy. What I'm really happy about is it gives me an opportunity to get out there everything that's stuck in my head. I'm one of those people that I, I, I don't sleep a lot. Uh, I, I'm constantly thinking, I'm constantly writing notes, and it has helped me tremendously to clear my head and to allow me to focus on business and on life. But the podcast has really been, um, it's probably the best place to hear not only my opinions and then also my technical information, but you'll learn a lot about me because um, I, I really put a lot of personality into it. Awesome. Andy, this has been absolutely amazing. Uh, this has been such a wide ranging conversation. Thank you for taking the time. And it, it's so informative. I'm actually mind blown at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Boomer. I, I really enjoyed being on the show. Uh, I apologize if I got off on too many tangents. but No, no tangents. This is great. Things, so many things to talk about. So I'd love to come back whenever um, you want me. Absolutely. Superhumans, the show notes for this one should be found at decodingsuperhuman.com slash healthy home. Thank you for listening and have an absolutely epic day. Superhumans, before you go, can I ask two favors? Did you enjoy that episode? If so, can you send me an email at podcast at decodingsuperhuman.com? Provide any feedback, positive or negative. I would love to hear from you. And for those of you who have really taken advantage of that, you know I respond to each email. Secondly, if you did enjoy the episode, can you head on over to iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, any one of your favorite podcast listening platforms, and give Decoding Superhuman a five-star rating. It would really be appreciated. And then finally, for those of you who are looking at taking an informed approach to health, head on over to decodingsuperhuman.com. Check out what we have going on over there. And if you want to schedule a free 15-minute discovery call with me, you're going to have that option. Superhumans, have an absolutely epic day. And remember, as always, choose health.